Good morning. On behalf of RSK, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's seminar where we will be looking at the global diversity framework and the role business will have to play. Later this year, world leaders will be adopting a brand new post-2020 global diversity framework, which will lead to actions, policies and regulations to achieve optimistically a nature positive world by 2030. Huge challenges ahead, but fortunately we have with us today a group of world-class experts to discuss both what that framework will entail, the implications for your business, the challenges and some of the solutions. We'll be hearing from Dr. Rich Young from the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, Mayel Pellison, Business for Nature, Amanda Williams from Spirex Sarco Engineering and Dr. Rossa Davis Donovan, apologies for Nature Positive. So a little bit of housekeeping first, we've got some social media uh, tags for you to note. Um, please tag anything RSK group and use the hashtag hashtag hash route to COP15. Instagram also, LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter, RSK group for all of those. A little bit of housekeeping as well. Um, your microphones will be automatically turned off throughout the speaker's time, um, but during their presentations you can put any questions you like to them in the control panel on your right and there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation from all four speakers. As many questions as we can get through, we will try to answer, but any that those can't be answered due to time will be kept on record and directed to the appropriate person. So hopefully you will get an answer from the expert that you need. After the webinar finishes at 10 o'clock, you'll receive a link to a short survey. Please um, provide any feedback, good or bad, so that we can do our best to improve these seminars and bring you what you most need for your business. That's it. So first of all, if I could ask uh, Dr. Rich Young to the stage, please. Um, Dr. Rich Young has worked in wildlife conservation practice for 20 years and is currently Director of Conservation Knowledge at the well-known international charity, the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust. He's a member of a task force developing International Union for Conservation of Nature and will be giving us uh, an overview of a global framework for measuring species recovery and looking at the impact on conservation. So over to you, Rich. Car Caroline, thank you very much. And um, uh, thank you to RSK for inviting me to uh, take part in this webinar. So, I'm a conservationist uh, and these are my perspectives on the global biodiversity framework shaped by my experience of working for an organisation that essentially works on the front line battling to save some of the world's rarest and most threatened wildlife. So I'll share, share my thoughts about what I want to see from the post-2020 global biodiversity framework but before I do it's important to uh, for us all to remind ourselves just quite how badly uh, humankind has damaged uh, the planet. According to an article I read a couple of years ago, conservationists are the most depressing people to go for a drink with. So, because um, after a pint they start ranting about the state of the world, so you have to just indulge me in a in a rant for a few few moments. So, the It Best report published in 2019 from the United Nations just showed how how uh, uh, how much damage has been done to the world's wildlife. One million species are estimated to face extinction. 75% of the surface area of the terrestrial environment has been significantly altered through human actions and two thirds of the marine realm also um, altered by, by people. And really the, one of the main reasons for this is the way that we produce and consume food. This graphic here shows you just quite how much we've converted um, the world's uh, mammal biomass uh, towards basically life, livestock and ourselves. So just 4% of the global mammal biomass now are wild species. And this has driven uh, massive losses of ecosystems and really obviously critically important ecosystems in terms of the functioning of the planet. So over the last 300 years, and in particular over the last th uh, 30 years, 1.5 billion hectares of forest, uh, mainly tropical forest, has been destroyed. That's one and a half times the size of the United States. Now, obviously this is important from a moral perspective in its own right, but also it's because it's important because nature sustains life on Earth and it, it enables, it provides a habitable planet for us to live on. And here this graphic shows all the different ecosystem services um, that are provided by, by nature that we rely on. And all of this really is summarised, uh, the scale of this uh, nature of this crisis is summarised by this graphic. Biodiversity collapse and causes interaction with global heating essentially dwarfs all the other social and planetary crises that we've, uh, that we've faced, but yet gets really very little attention. So the global biodiversity framework 
provide some hope that the world may be waking up to this problem. But a, a note of caution, we have to be realistic. In 2010, some 10, uh, 20 biodiversity targets, the so-called HE biodiversity targets were set, uh, and an assessment of those um, targets just recently showed that we've not, not met in full or any of them. We only met in part a handful of them, and some targets, for example, around species extinction risk, we've actually gone backwards. But the world is starting to talk positively and set this global, uh, global goal for nature, for us to be nature positive by 2030, a full recovery by 2050. So I want to share five things that I want to see as a conservationist represented in the global biodiversity framework. The first thing we have to, to ensure is that we have effective protection of the world's remaining systems and we ecosystems and we know where, where the most important sites of biodiversity are in the world. The key biodiversity area initiative pinpoints those these sites of global biodiversity importance. Unfortunately, not that met, uh, only proportion of these are in protected areas or are legally protected, and only even smaller proportion are in protected areas that are effectively managed. You'll hear the, the phrase 30 by 30, this is a, a global commitment uh, playing out at national level, we're trying to protect 30% of land and seas by 2030 for biodiversity conservation. But this is going to take some serious investment. The best analysis that I can find that shows you the scale of investment needed and um, was published back in 2010, but it shows we need around about just shy of $80 billion annually to protect and effectively manage these important biodiversity sites. And that's just a terrestrial one. So it's a, and this represents at least an order of magnitude increase in where we are today. But we can't just stop at protecting what's left. We have to drive recovery at scale. At the moment, there are species that are probably not known to many people on this webinar that are sliding towards extinction. This is one we work on, the Madagascar potchard. There are just 20, 25 individuals left in the wild. Lots of species are, are disappearing without us even knowing. So we have to save and recover important species uh, and also important ecosystems such as these, these uh, mangrove forests here. The IUCN, the World Conservation Body, estimates that to achieve the 2030 and 2050 goals, we're going to need additional investment in nature equivalent to around about 1% of annual global GDP. So these are big numbers, but to my third point, nowhere near as big as the amount of money that is um, subsidizing planet destroying activities. This analysis here uh, points to 1.8 trillion US dollars uh, annually um, supporting activities that are essentially damaging the planet, whether it's fossil fuel production, uh, and industries or agriculture. $520 billion going towards agricultural subsidies that are, that are um, destroying ecological systems. And really we have to make some big changes in how we produce our food and how we use it. And as individuals, our diets. And this I really want to see uh, represented in the global biodiversity framework, but also re re reflecting the fact that local communities, nature dependent communities, absolutely rely on natural resources the few food and fuel, fiber and medicine, and that needs to be reflected too. And my last point is to come to business, the theme of this uh, webinar. The Council for Sustainable Business uh, defined nature positive as an approach that puts nature and biodiversity game at the heart of decision-making design. It's a really good phrase, really accessible phrase, but it's open to many interpretations. And we really need to be clear on what we mean by nature positive. Business really will drive the transformation um, that needed to uh, save our planet. Oxford University, um, a team uh, based at Oxford University, just very recently published an analysis of their biodiversity footprint. It's a really leading piece of work that I recommend everybody has a look at. They estimated all um, their, their entire biodiversity footprint and, and ways uh, recommendations for strategies about how to reduce this either through avoidance or indeed through offset. They really clear what they mean by nature positive. Um, they set out a number of criteria about what we mean. This is not just about doing something for nature because that's better than nothing. This is being really clear about what a business should be doing. A business needs a measured biodiversity baseline to know where they're starting from and know what their footprint is today. They need a target. Um, to set to try and reduce uh, to get towards net biodiversity gain and a time frame over which um, to achieve that target. They need clear sets of actions to be carried out, costed and sequenced, and an analysis uh, of how these actions will add up to, uh, to get to net gain. And ultimately, regular monitoring and importantly, disclosure and transparency of progress towards this goal. So these are my five thoughts or the five things that I want to see in the global biodiversity framework. 
um, we're going to, the conservation practitioner community will be watching with interest about how the discussions play out in China, hopefully later this year. And we really hope and expect to see transformational change and political will to make a difference for, for the planet. Caroline, back to you. Many thanks, Richard, for opening the door to today's important discussion for us. A couple of questions for you from on the back of your presentation. You did mention that uh, there's only a dawning awakening for the importance of the biodiversity framework. Why do you think that it has been relatively overlooked up until now? That's a huge question. Requires probably a long, complicated answer, but I'll try and keep it quick. Um, I, th I think there are there are whole range of social, cultural, financial um, factors at play. I think humankind really fundamentally has got to a point where it sees itself as distant from nature, not part of it. And that is at the, at the, as the foundation to this. But biodiversity is a really complex concept or, or entity. It's very difficult to measure simply. And I think when it comes to business, businesses have really struggled to try and conceptualize what biodiversity is, what it means to them and to start measuring it to understand what their impact is and what they can do to try and improve things. But I just want to quote the paper that ran the Oxford University study. It's the closing paragraph, and I think it's really upside. So they, they close by saying, time is too short to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, or to claim that biodiversity net gain is too hard to achieve because there is no universal biodiversity metric. Individual metrics are imperfect, but improving, and their limitations should not be a reason to delay measuring, disclosing, tackling impacts on biodiversity. And I think that kind of sums up why businesses mm -hmm. have struggled to think about biodiversity in particular. Sure. In short, get started. Um, get um, my second question for you at the moment is, uh, as businesses, lots of businesses attending today, what do you think uh, for practitioners in this field is perhaps the single biggest challenge that lies ahead? Yeah, there are many. Um, but of course, we could do much more if we had the resources. Funding is constantly a barrier to delivery of um, endangered species programs, habitat protection and restoration. We have to work as a charity extremely hard to win money to be able to do what is uh, essential work in terms of trying to essentially say, ensure that the planet is habitable for our children and grandchildren. So if funding suddenly became much more um, plentiful then we could do so much more we know we conservation works we know how to do it uh, but we need resources to be able to do it with thank you well hopefully seminars like this will highlight that need to people with the pockets um thank you very much richard for now um can we move on to the second speaker for today's seminar we have Mile pellison who is a business for nature Adv advocacy director and she leads the coalition's policy engagement around the United Nations negotiations on nature, including the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Prior to that, she's worked abroad for many years, including in Brussels, engaging with the European Union on renewable energy policies. Delighted to have you with us today, Mayel. So can you start to introduce the world of business to this conversation of biodiversity for us, please? Hey, thank you so much, Caroline, and hi, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know about Business for Nature, maybe quickly, uh, we are a global coalition. We bring together more than 70 uh, partners that are business organizations and NGOs working with business on driving more actions. And really, our mission is to demonstrate and amplify a credible business voice uh, on nature to give the confidence and the comfort to policymakers to adopt ambitious policies now to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. So we have a very clear and, and simple theory of change that if we can demonstrate to policymakers that business are acting, that solutions are possible, that it's already happening, that would give them the confidence to adopt more ambitious policies that would then in turn push more businesses to act and creating this, this nice positive feedback loop. So that's why we are very actively engaged in um, the CBD, so the Convention on Biological Diversity, in the negotiation of the CBD post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, complicated title. Um, we really hope that once adopted at COP15, taking place later this year in China, if ambitious enough, it could really become the equivalent of the Paris Agreement on Climate for Nature. 
Um, so we really engage on this. One key lessons learned from the Paris Agreement is that it was only achieved and, and adopted because the business, the leading business were really behind it, pushing governments, asking governments to be ambitious. We need the same level of engagement around biodiversity. It's we're a bit behind, you know, the, the, the topic of biodiversity has been less visible than, than climate, but as Richard mentioned, it's it's as important. So really we saw in the last two years more and more businesses engaging on this topic. So so that's really great and really important as well in the context of those negotiations. Um, so we've heard from Richard why it's so important to achieve such a, a framework. I just wanted to go back maybe and just explaining a bit for the audience here, what, what are we talking about with this global biodiversity framework and what why is it important for business and why we should all care? So there's a simple structure of the framework. So there's a 2050 vision that is already adopted, which is living in harmony with nature. So that's what we should achieve by 2050. Now to support this, all the rest is still under negotiations. Um, we will have four goals for 2050, including on nature conservation, on protection of ecosystem services, on access and benefit sharing, and on the finance to achieve this, uh, all these targets. And then we have the 2030 mission. And for us, this is very central. It's very important to have a clear, simple and ambitious mission that would set the world to halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. So Richard showed this very nice graph um, of what does it mean? And that means being nature positive, meaning that by 2030, we have more nature around the world than we had in 2020. So that would set a very clear goal for all businesses, for all actors, for the civil society of where we need to be by 2030. It's still under negotiation. However, in the last round of discussion, we saw a very strong consensus from governments around this mission. So we're really positive that that will be adopted in the framework and can really be the equivalent of the 1.5 degree on climate for nature. So then this 2030 mission would be then supported by currently 21 targets uh, called the action target for 2030. And this is where the details are then important for businesses. So, I mean, we know that all of this is all interrelated. So all the targets are um, to some extent important for businesses, some more than others. So I just wanted to highlight maybe here the target 15, uh, which is what we call the business targets. Uh, so it's a target that, that explain what's the role of business and what business will be expected to do once is this framework is adopted. So at the moment, as I said, all under negotiation, but at the moment the target is requiring businesses to assess and report on their impact on biodiversity and to reduce their negative impact by at least 50% by 2030. Um, so this is really central. We already saw that just having a draft target that address directly businesses is creating a lot of momentum, a lot of excitement in the business community on how do we implement this, you know, what needs to happen, how can we organize ourselves internally, uh, etc. So we're really pushing for a strong um, target 15. However, as I said, a lot of other targets like target seven on pollution, target eight on climate, sustainable use, uh, target 10 on, on land use will be very uh, relevant as well for, for the business community. So as Business for Nature, we've been engaging in this process. Our main objective is to push for something ambitious, realistic and actionable by businesses. So we're running uh, regularly some business consultation. We are organizing business delegation in all the CBD negotiation to bring this business voice, to give the confidence to policymakers that, that it's, it's makes business sense to adopt such targets. So we have a set of recommendations. I won't go into detail, but you know, on the mission I mentioned on target 15, we are calling for mandatory requirements for all business to assess and disclose their impact and dependencies. We're working very actively on the subsidies, which had mentioned the 1.8 trillion of harmful, environmentally harmful subsidies. We need a strong target that commits to reform all the subsidies, eliminate and redirect the say, financial savings to make sure that we support um, positive and reward um, businesses to, to, to do positive actions. So where, where are we now? Uh, so the, after two years of, of a bit of a delay in the negotiation due to the COVID pandemic, the negotiation started again face to face. So we had the last, um, the first negotiation meeting after two, uh, two years in Geneva in March. Uh, there was a lot of excitement. Everyone was really happy to meet again face to face. However, a bit of disappointment on the pace of the negotiation. There was a lot of sharing, not a lot of negotiating and resolving issues. So as a result, there is very li limited consensus on most of the 21 targets. Um, everything is still up for, for discussion and, and for more um, 
for more negotiation. However, three positive elements. I mentioned the consensus on the mission to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. The second positive is that we really saw like the recognition of the role of business that the business have to play. Uh, we organized a business delegation with more than 40 companies that were here in Geneva engaging with policymakers. It was the first time that there was such a, a large business um, delegation. And, and I think the progressive voice that we brought was really welcomed by policymakers. And I think in every single meeting we have of governments, many of they were telling us that's the first time we hear business being so proactive, so progressive, asking actually for more ambition than what parties and, and governments are actually being negotiating. So that gave us confidence that we need to continue this engagement and need to continue bringing this, this positive business voice um, in this negotiation. So on the process, very quickly, because of the result in Geneva was not as good as we would have hoped, an extra negotiation meeting has been organized. It will take place in Nairobi, in Kenya, uh, end of June. And Business for Nature will be there with a business delegation. So if you're interested to join us, um, please contact contact me and then we will have the COP15 which will be when the framework will be adopted. Um, it's going to take place in China, the date is still under discussion but it would be uh, probably in Q3 2022 and so that would be the big moment where the framework is adopted. So join us in, in, in this work, we already we have a call to action called Nature is Everyone's Business where already more than 1,000 companies um, have signed and are engaging in, in this call for ambitious policies. Um, so if you are interested in joining the Business for Nature community, you can sign this call to action. Join us contributing in all our um, consultations and, and engagement with policymakers. So four things you can do to get engaged. Sign the call to action. Talk about nature. We need to raise it on the agenda in your, internally, externally, with your peers. You know, really putting uh, nature more on the agenda as it is now. Call for ambitious policies. We have uh, all our policy recommendations and speaking points that you can use when you engage. And also very important, make sure that we continue to integrate nature and climate together as they are two parts of the same problem and they can be solved together or not be solved uh, separately. So that's very important. So I'll, I'll stop here and, and hand back to you, Caroline, for if you have any questions. Many thanks, Maya. Um, I just have one question for you at the moment, which is huge surge for change, clearly, on a go global scale. Um, once this happens and it is adopted, what will be the principal role of business? What will they then pick up as their first task? Thanks. Well, the role of business will be central, I think, on, in, in two ways. The first way is to engage on the implementation. And once the framework is adopted at global level, it would need to be translated at national level. So government will develop national targets, national action plans. So I think we business have a key role to play here to assist the government in developing those business roadmap so that there is a clear, you know, actions that they can take. The second role is act engage you know review the targets review the indicators set your own targets in line with those with those targets use all the existing tools and emerging tools like the science-based target network the tnfd you know and and get on it great goodness no small thing sounds as though some big work lies ahead thank you very much mail um, we have up for our next speaker amanda williams who is the head of sustainability steam specialities for spirex sarco Amanda is a chartered environmentalist with almost 20 years experience working in the sustainability field. She's also the strategic initiative lead for the biodiversity net gain at Spirex Sarco and has a particular interest in how businesses can help protect and restore nature. So Amanda, please could you um, lead us into your biodiversity initiatives? Thank you, Caroline, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks to RSK as well for the invitation to take part um, and talk a little bit about how our business is addressing biodiversity. Um, on the first slide, uh, just a quick intro for context, because I know we're not necessarily a household brand at Spire Sarko Engineering. So we're a multinational FTSE 100 um, industrial engineering group, specialists in steam solutions, electric thermal energy management and fluid path technologies. And we have 29 manufacturing plants worldwide serving customers in around 130 countries. On the next slide, I just want to position our biodiversity initiative within our kind of wider sustainability strategy. In June 2021, we launched our One Planet Engineering with Purpose strategy. And this is our commitment to sustainability and our roadmap to building a more sustainable future. 
It guides our operations as we work with others, including our suppliers, our customers, and our local communities. And the Biodiversity Net Gain is one of six strategic initiatives which will drive progress. The other areas are net zero emissions, um, environmental improvements in our operations, sustainable products, supplier sustainability, and community wellbeing. And by implementing this strategy, we hope to achieve our company purpose, which is to create sustainable value for our stakeholders as we engineer a more efficient, safer, and sustainable world. So on the next slide, I'd just like to introduce you to our biodiversity initiative. During the review of our um, group sustainability strategy, we agreed that although biodiversity didn't actually rate very highly in our materiality assessment, we should have a biodiversity initiative. This was based on a belief that all businesses must be taking action in this area. And some of our top level objectives and targets are outlined on the screen now. Um, in 2020, we worked with Nature Positive, RSK, um, to carry out a study to identify our direct impacts and dependencies um, on, on biodiversity and, and to set targets and objectives for reducing them. As you can see, our initial focus is on our direct impact, but the next stage will be to qualify impacts across our entire value chain in readiness for setting uh, wider targets. Today, I just briefly want to introduce you to two elements of the initiative. Um, and on the next slide, I'll just talk a little bit about how we um, are addressing land take, if you like. So we recognize that a significant impact of our direct operations is the land that we occupy. And we decided a key element would be to address this land take. We also recognize that funding for nature protection is a key barrier. And so, so here we can work on, on addressing that in some small way too. So as we know, the draft global biodiversity framework indicated that between 30 and 50% of the land and sea area of the world should be protected for the benefit of nature. Because if we allow nature to occupy half of the world, natural ecosystem processes should be able to function effectively. So we calculated the total area of our direct global operational footprint, which came out at around 517 acres. And, and we considered um, how we could address that through, through a bio, biodiversity offset, if you like. So, so we considered options around, <clears throat> should we do a partial offset? a full or no net loss offset or a nature positive offset and of course the right approach to take was to to go for a nature positive approach so we decided to offset the equivalent area of our group operation footprint every year um, for five years so a total of 2585 acres um, to do this we partnered with the world land trust who who support the establishment of new nature reserves and we particularly wanted to um, target an area where we had a manufacturing presence in, in, in that part of the world. And the World Land Trust works with local partners to fund permanent protection of habitats in around 20 countries, including a number where we have manufacturing um, facilities. So, so they tend to work in highly biodiverse areas that are under threat from human activity. And they also empower local communities to develop sustainable livelihoods um, at the same time as, as working to tackle climate change and biodiversity um, loss. So um, on the next slide, just a little more information about the project that we selected. Um, so a total of 2,585 hectares of previously unprotected habitat in Argentinian um, Patagonia in an area called the Summon Ferrer Plateau um, will be protected in perpetuity as a result of our partnership contributing towards the creation of a, a, a larger new nature reserve. And this is the first ever protected area in, in that part of Argentinian Patagonia. And, and the habitat is kind of predominantly shrubland habitat intermixed with grassland, scrub, rocky outcrops and streams. But importantly, it's home to a host of endemic and persecuted species that are currently at risk um, in that area. Um, on the next slide, the, the second area that I just want to highlight um, from the various uh, aspects of our initiative is, is um, a requirement for each of our operating companies around the world to carry out a biodiversity improvement initiative themselves, either on site or in the, their local community. Um, <clears throat> and, and we developed some biodiversity initiative guidance um, here. 
because we wanted to really highlight some some key um, elements and, and set some guide rails, if you like. So, for example, we make clear that individual approaches have got to be tailored to the local context and conditions. And we address a range of issues like, um, you know, preventing the spread of invasive species and, and so on. And the reason I wanted to highlight this bit is that actually, you know, as we've heard from previous speakers, engaging people in this issue is really important. And in employee engagement in response to this part of our strategic initiative has been phenomenal. Um, because biodiversity is something really tangible, right? That you can see and hear and smell, unlike carbon emissions, perhaps, um, you know, which are, which are slightly more difficult in, in terms of a subject for our employees to get really excited about, I think. So, so we've seen a great response to this. And the size and scale of the project varies um, depending on the local context. Um, but but um, we, we're also seeing that our colleagues are working with local organisations to invest in, in nature protection um, at various scales across all of our location. Um, finally, because I know time is short, on the next slide, I just want to highlight um, some of our kind of opportunities and challenges that we've identified um, and also talk a bit, uh, first of all, about our next steps. <clears throat> so, we continue to implement these elements of the biodiversity initiative that relate to our direct operations, of course. <clears throat> um, and we're also verifying the biodiversity net gain um, for our new facilities that are going to be delivered in, in 2022 and 2023. And again, we're being supported by some external expertise here from, from RSK. Um, but we're now starting to carry out a strategic assessment of the biodiversity impact in our wider um, supply chain. <clears throat> via a value chain hotspot analysis. Um, we're building biodiversity into a new supply sustainability um, monitoring platform questionnaire that we're developing. And, and we're aiming to set some targets next to address biodiversity impacts in our supply chain, with the aim overall, of course, of becoming nature positive. <clears throat> so the, the global biodiversity framework, um, as well as other pressures, such as increased investor interest in this subject, will, of course, accelerate business action on the biodiversity crisis. Um, <clears throat> we're a global business, but local context must be considered at all times. And, and I think that's really important to highlight. Even in a large business as well, we rely on external expertise and support. Um, I'm, I'm not an ecologist. I'm more of a general practitioner of sustainability. So we need and have needed expert input. Smaller businesses are going to really need a lot of help with this, I think it's fair to say. Um, we, we also find that biodiversity net gain is less well understood outside the UK and certainly outside of Europe. So we're having to do some work around developing knowledge and capacity on this. And, and also the, the due diligence requirements of a major corporation like ours can seem onerous to some charitable partners. So I think we all, we all need to think about making sure that our approach is um, uh, proportionate and, and appropriate. So we're on a journey, we're starting with our direct impacts, we're progressing to our wider value chain impacts, and we're really leaning in on partnerships such as um, our work with RSK and with the World Land Trust to ensure that we're taking action that will deliver um, real value and, and, and benefits that are indeed nature positive. Um, so that's all, all from me for now. Thank you for listening. Uh, and for your interest in this subject and I'll hand back to Caroline. Goodness me Amanda, so much going on even in just one company. Um, just one question for you at the moment which is that, that target 15 you mentioned, the post 2020 biodiversity, how achievable is that and what do you think will be the response from business when they see what's involved? Well, I really welcome the inclusion of a target for business in, in the draft uh, global biodiversity framework. And, and I think this should um, also highlight that action for nature is intrinsically linked um, to action for climate change. Um, we believe that all businesses should be taking action in this area, as I mentioned earlier, um, to help reverse that loss of nature. Um, but I think we need to acknowledge that this is going to be a real challenge um, for some businesses. Um, for example, will small businesses really have the understanding, the capacity or the budget to address this fully by 2030? Um, so it may be ambitious to ask businesses of any size to report across the full value chain by that time. That's not to say that we shouldn't do it. 
Um, but I think whether this will be achievable across all businesses will, will of course depend on the complexity of the reporting requirements, the support that's available, um, and, and, and perhaps, you know, uh, the design of this could reflect the size of the business and so on. So a proportionate approach may, may be necessary, whether that's determined by the size, uh, the sector or, or the level of impact. Um, you know, and, and, and let's acknowledge that all businesses will need support with this. Um, the key thing, I think, is that businesses need to understand their biodiversity dependencies and impacts. They need to make commitments and embed this in their decision making. Um, and they will need, we will need transparency, right? But the reporting and the disclosing requirements need to be balanced with not taking resource away from making a positive impact. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Amanda. Right, our fourth and final speaker today is Dr. Rosset Donovan. He is the Technical Director at Nature Positive. He is a chartered ecologist and a sustainability expert of more than 25 years standing. He uh, is also leading the development, sorry, prior to Nature Positive, he was at Network Rail. So he's had corporate experience as well, uh, where he led their Network Rail's 30 year sustainability strategy. And he has a particular interest, which may be key to some of you of the circular economy. So welcome, Rossa. Please take us through your perspective on this challenging area. Thanks, Caroline, um, and thanks for inviting me today to speak. So, um, as Caroline says, I'm Ross Donovan from Nature Positive. Nature Positive is, is a, an org, a, a consultancy business that basically works with organisations to help them understand their relationship with nature. So, what are their impacts? What are their dependencies? And um, how can they um, set meaningful targets and action plans to actually um, reduce that those impacts? Um, across their whole, not only their direct but indirect operations as well. So um, as a sort of summary of what businesses can do for nature uh, and to support the global biodiversity framework, I'm going to talk about baselining impacts and dependencies. I'm going to talk about setting targets in, and in particular science-based targets for nature. Um, and then I'm going to talk about corporate reporting and disclosure. So I'm going to talk about the task force on nature related financial disclosures, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk a bit about integrating biodiversity into your ESG strategies. Um, so it's interesting that we, we carried out, a, we wrote a report last year where we looked at the top uh, the FTSE 100 in, um, companies. Um, and by analysing their annual reports and their strategies, corporate strategies and so on, we found that more than half don't have an understanding of their relationship with nature. Um, whilst there are some out there which are very proactive um, and some have a partial understanding, you know, more than half really don't have any idea at all. So the first thing that you can do and um, I think Richard and both Amanda have said this, is that you need to understand your baseline. You need to understand what your impacts are, both direct and indirect, so that you can then set targets and um, create an action plan to go forward. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware, direct impacts we define as um, impacts that occur from activities and sites over which your company has direct operational and financial control. So your the, your day-to-day -day business sites, if you like, the, the ones where you manufacture your goods, you sell your sell your goods and so on, um, will be your direct impacts. But there'll also be indirect impacts, and these occur within a company's value chain. So that can be upstream, so from your suppliers, where you get your raw materials from, and that the, the production of those raw materials and transport to your, your factories, what, what have you. Um, or downstream, so the, the distribution um, and products that you sort of then sell on in order to run your business. Um, so that's the first step, you need to understand your baseline. Then you need to evaluate where biodiversity poses the greatest risk to your business. And to do this, we use global data sets to identify high risk sites. So uh, sites within um, perhaps um, triple SIs or um, European protected sites or, or globally protected sites. And we look at your activities and we look at the, the products, what you're doing on those sites, the sort of processes that, that are being carried out on that, those sites. And then we create a heat map. The value chains are very large, um, complex um, um, things. And so you can't 
you can't evaluate absolutely everything. So there's a benefit in prioritizing the biggest impacts um, and then to produce action plans for those priority risks and the dependencies and then integrate, integrate them into your strategy. Once you've done that, once you understand your baseline, and you understand the size of the impact that your, your business has, you then can set targets and you can set the sort of number of targets you can set, but the ones that we always recommend are science-based targets for nature. Now, you've probably all heard of the science-based targets for carbon, for net zero. Um, these are effectively exactly the same, but they're built on an understanding of the nature-related risks facing a business. Um, and while some of these risks may be down the road, the greatest risk facing companies today is in action. So the sooner you get started, um, this sort of reinforces Richard's message at the beginning, um, you know, the quicker your change is going to happen. Um, so like science-based targets for carbon, they consider impacts from the company's direct operations and the indirect ones in their supply chain, so upstream and downstream. But they also consider value chain adjacent areas. So the areas adjacent to your value, to, to your, your supply chain's uh, premises and so on, um, because nature operates within a wider la landscape or a seascape or a watershed um, and can sort of influence uh, biodiversity outside of the boundary of those sites. Um, but also systems. You need to think about financial systems. You need to think about industry practices and standards. And you need to think about corporate influence in the form of lobbying as well. Um, so then once you've got your targets you, you, and hopefully an action plan, you've started to integrate those into your strategy, you need to think about disclosure, you need to think about governance of meet, meeting those action plans and the, the task force on nature related financial disclosures, again very similar to the task force on climate related financial disclosures, is um, an excellent framework for doing so. Um, it's not mandatory at the moment, but it is likely to be um, certainly be voluntary. Um, at the moment and hopefully mandatory in the future. But it's important that the board of a company has governance over the direction of travel, uh, meeting those biodiversity targets. And you need to have appropriate strategies. They need to identify the actual and potential impacts and dependencies on nature, the risks and opportunities for business and build them into the business strategy and financial planning. You also need to have a form of risk management as well, so you can process a process to assess and manage nature-related nature, nature related risks. And you need to um, also obviously have appropriate metrics and clear targets that the company can follow. And to be transparent in your reporting of these, just as companies are being, um, well, mandatory now for carbon for many companies, but it's only encouraged to do from a nature-related financial disclosure point of view. And then finally, um, I'm going to talk about integrating biodiversity into ESG strategies. So it's important that your biodiversity strategy doesn't sit alone from the rest of your strategies. Quite a lot of the businesses we have worked with in the past, they will have a carbon strategy, they'll have a biodiversity strategy, they'll have a circular economy strategy. In reality, all of these things are linked because, um, because there are feedbacks between but both carbon and biodiversity, and you can't talk about carbon and biodiversity in the same space um, separately. You need to talk about them in the same space. So, just to summarize, you need to evaluate your company's direct and indirect impacts and dependencies on nature, create the action plans to reduce the biodiversity impacts, deal with the highest priority ones first, and then work down the list for the medium and low priority ones um, in, in the future. Set science based targets for nature. Um, it will give you a lot of credibility if you do. Um, and importantly, integrate your carbon and biodiversity offsetting strategies because that can save you money, um, but it can also bring synergies between the two. And um, what we're telling businesses at the moment is get ready for TNFD. It's not, as I say, it's not mandatory at the moment, but it may well be in the future. And certainly after COP15, governments may, may well um, start to require companies to start reporting on their nature. Uh, related financial disclosures. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Caroline. 
Many thanks, Rossa. Lots of practical suggestions and ideas there, hopefully of great interest to the businesses with us today. Uh, I have just a couple of questions for you at the moment before we get going with the Q&A, uh, which is uh, for a complete self-starter, for somebody who comes to this bald and, and very much an ingenue in the sustainability area, where should a company start if they have made no action up to this point? What's the first priority, basic entry level step that you would suggest? Um, well, the first things that we suggest are that they look at where their sites are geographically. So um, they, they need to map out all of their depots, offices, you know, factory sites and, and to work out their direct impacts. Um, and wherever they are in the country geographically, we then match that to any, um, you know, nature, nature conservation sites that are sort of in the area or any populations of protected species. And then we assess their impacts based on um, or their activities and see what impacts they might have on those nature conservation sites. So that's that's sort of start with your direct emission, uh, direct impacts. But then you need you do need to start looking at your value chain um, impacts as well, which is more complicated. Um, but it's you know very very important. You might be um, you know you might be sourcing timber from an unsustainable source, for, ex for example. You might be getting some, you know um, aggregates from a, a, an area of particularly high biodiversity. And you need yep. to understand that and you need to sort of weigh up the options and see by, you know, sourcing things differently or sourcing different materials, you can mm -hmm. actually reduce your impact on nature. OK. Um, and very briefly, before we try and squeeze in as many other questions as possible, where should we look to for inspiration? In your view, which sector is doing a good job at the moment? Um, so I've been really surprised. I've only been with Nature Positive for a, a, a few months now, but I've been really surprised there's a lot of construction companies that are actually starting to think about this. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of water companies, power distribution companies that are actually thinking about this. So, you know, companies which have the potential to have a quite a high impact on the landscape, if you like, and on nature are starting to think about this seriously. Great. Thank you very much. Um, lovely. Thank you all to all four speakers for their individual efforts this morning. If I could now ask you to rejoin me, all of you, on the stage. Uh, we have some questions flying in, lots of questions. I'll try to get through as many as possible. Uh, but as we've said, any that we don't get to will remain on the record and hopefully you can either direct your questions to your most pertinent expert and they'll be back in touch with you or they will read through them as well and answer what they can. So let's start. Goodness, my panel has disappeared. Right. Okay. Questions. First one. Oh, goodness me. This is quite, um, this is a biggie. So for companies wanting to do all this, how would their business model be affected? A potential technique is scenario analysis. So what scenarios are the most authoritative and how would a company start using these scenarios in their analysis? Who would like to take that? So I think this is about starting out. So looking at business versus biodiversity, it needn't be zero sum, but where do, what where do you go for authority you, there, there are lots of companies competing to provide these kind of services where do you go to start out knowing that you're going in the right direction i think that probably is one for you rossa as a consultant to well i mean you can do going... this by, by coming to see nature positive and we can sort of walk you through <laughs> the steps uh, sure. uh, could, could not get that one in um so i mean i think there are tools and frameworks out there that uh, it's a very um, far quickly developing space and there's a lot of tools out there that are being developed at the moment and I don't think that the market has settled on which are the best tools to use um, but that shouldn't stop you from actually taking action using any tool at the moment is much better than doing nothing I think that's the, that's the main message I'd like to um, and um, you do need to think about you know you, you do need to look at your business strategy again so that it incorporates nature you can't do this separately um, and what we found is that by looking at value chain just as just as you know from a carbon point of view if you look at a value chain um, from a biodiversity point of view you can also help identify savings which will help fund the biodiversity you know the nature positive biodiversity initiatives that you'd want to um, to, to use okay thank you very much um, this is an interesting one and I think Maya this is one for you. Um, somebody has asked, what are the penalties or punishments if companies fail to implement the measures 
to mitigate the impact of business operations on the environment or ignore all of the requirements that you so carefully and punctiliously set out in your framework that you're working so hard to create? What if somebody just ignores and continues to ride roughshod putting business first? What are the punishments and penalties for that? Thanks, that's a good question. So the, the CBD framework is is a government-led process, right? So it's a it's a framework that government commits to and they are then legally binded to develop action plans to implement this framework. So the, the global framework itself won't have any requirement for business to do. It's just clarifying at a global level what national governments would then need to be doing. So once it's adopted, all governments that are parties to the CBD, which is most government around the world, will need to translate this target into national law. So I guess the penalties would depend on, on what each government, you know, decide and, 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 you know, it might be very different in Indonesia than it would be in France. So, you know, so, so, I, so the framework is not giving this, this clear, but it, but it just depends how it's translated at national level. So the, all the binding requirements for business would come from the national law that would be adopted on the back of the global agreement. Sure. So hence the importance, the crucial need for collaboration and cooperation between countries. Exactly. And, and having something at global level so that all those rules are aligned and are at the same level of ambition. So you create this level playing field and then you hope that all the rules would be the same, more or less, at least at the same level of ambition in, in every country. Thank you. Rossi, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think from a UK perspective, and apologies for our, our sort of international um, uh, people on, on the call, um, certainly things like the Environment Act have strengthened the uh, biodiversity protection and now certain companies are required to achieve 10% net gain um, whenever they, they do developments and so on, uh, which is a good start. Um, but I also recently saw a Nature Recovery Green paper, which is looking to you know, embed the targets of 30 by 30, you know, um, into sort of national legislation. And so the global biodiversity framework, as, as Mel says, will be really important um, for governments to get behind so that they can set those policies um, up and, and create legislation to actually enforce it. Thank you. Amanda, we have a very specific one about Spirex Arco. So um, corporate hat on. Um, lots of praise and pleasure in hearing that the engagement of the company is so profound and established. Um, uh, we have the question pointing out that Patagonia is notorious for conservation capitalism, areas taken from local people as reserves to serve wealthy business interests elsewhere. I think somebody else also perhaps you could incorporate this because also another question about protecting indigenous rights. How aware of Spirax of this issue and how do you ensure perhaps not just Patagonia but everywhere that when you make these offset calculations, they're done in a just and equitable way. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important issue. And of course, we're, we're aware of, of these kind of issues. And for me, selection of your project partner is absolutely critical here. Um, and the due diligence process that you need to go through in selecting a corporate par partner. And, and it won't surprise you to know that as a big organization, we have really thorough due diligence processes. Um, not just in terms of the due diligence that we did on the World Land Trust, but also we look very closely at the due diligence they do when they're selecting their local partners uh, in the countries where they operate. Um, and, and it has to be said, you know, uh, there are lots of organisations out there who, who can offer you uh, to work with you on these kind of issues. Um, but what's quite um, unique, I suppose, about the World Land Trust in some ways is that they, one of their key aims is to empower local communities um, and that's one of the key reasons that we chose to work with them um, because that's one of the you know kind of unique selling points of the of the partnership with them so so i think it's all about um choosing local partnerships very very carefully so that you know that they have an understanding of issues on the ground thank you and uh, uh, a follow-up question also people are very interested in this project in argentina can you give an idea of the cost as a percentage of company turnover or profit? I mean, I guess that some of that is highly confidential, but uh, could you give us what indication you can as just a marker of the commitment in, in numerical terms? Yeah, I, I, I don't have that figure off the top of my head, to be entirely honest with you, um, but I'm um, certainly happy to follow up with um, whoever sent in the question. I, I think okay. the important thing to note, though, of course, is that this is just the start of the journey for our direct um, uh, impact. 
uh, when you get into uh, addressing your indirect impact, then of course that's a much more significant area of work, which will indeed lead to much further investment. Okay, thank you. I think that's absolutely fair without the numbers to hand. Um, I have a question. I think, Rich, you're possibly best placed for this, which is uh, it taps in with the overview, the always available culture, especially in the food sector, being such a major driver of biodiversity loss. You mentioned even our eating habits having such an effect. How can businesses, never mind individuals, change practices while also upholding financial duties to investors, shareholders, keeping their businesses going? How do you balance that? Well, that's a tough question for a conservationist. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on an aspect of it and maybe other people can come in because this isn't that, this really is my area. But um, I, I would point to the question to look at the um, the piece of work um, done by the team at University of Oxford looking at their biodiversity footprint. And I know it's not a for-profit organisation, um, but they did a lot of assessment about their uh, their supply chain when it comes to catering within within the university, what that meant downstream in terms of biodiversity impacts, and they're very much pushing essentially that all you know pro that their provision of food on site is all vegetarian, essentially moving away absolutely from from meat. So we are, we are as individuals and organisations going to have to make some you know bold changes, some some big um, disruptive changes in, in a sense, but but we you know we we really face little choice. What that means in terms of you know, uh, you know an organization's bottom line i don't know I, I couldn't touch on that but um but yeah the food food production systems and consumer choice there needs to be some major changes there that starts with the individual thank you would anybody else like to pick up on that the the ever green dilemma Mael, between business yeah financial I think maybe just and future. if i can add to what richard mentioned i think it's also there's a lot of individual companies can do but at the same time we need to transform the system the, the current economic and financial system is rewarding short-term profits and financial performance and not long-term value creation. So there's all, only so much an individual company can do if the whole system is not moving in the right direction. And I think that's why the enabling policy environment is so important um, to be, you know, in, in addition to what individual company, I'm not saying they shouldn't act, but, you know, we need to transform the system, um, especially okay. in the food system. Um, got a very practical, two very quick questions. So if you could make your answers brief, so we can squeeze them both in. Um, first of all, I don't know who's best placed to answer this. Feel free to put your hand up. What metrics would a business use to measure impact on biodiversity, particularly for existing operations? How do you measure whether an offsetting action will be nature positive? That sounds deceptively straightforward, that question, but I'm sure it's a very complicated answer. Amanda, perhaps that's one for you. Well, the simple answer there was that we had to get RSK in to support us with that process. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I mean, R Richard probably is the best place to um, uh, answer that question because we did lean in on their support for that. So I think we need we need to you need to look at your footprint of your operational sites in the first place, basically. So how much land does your business take up? Um, that's a good starting point. Um, okay. And then from that, you can then work out what level of offsetting you need to do. There are, there are metrics, as I say, that are being developed, but the marketplace hasn't really settled on what are the best ones to use at the moment. So if it's a project scale, you could use a DEFRA metric in, in the UK, um, but more internationally, there's other metrics you could use. Fantastic. I think that is very sadly all we have time for, though. There are lots more questions, so do keep them coming. These experts are wonderfully available for you to pick their brains and hear some more of ideas. I think we've all heard enormous amounts today. Right, so what have we we've heard? Hopefully it's been helpful. Rich Young's given us an overview of this dramatic um, challenge ahead, but just how much is at stake. Mile has given us a wonderful global perspective of how much work is being done and then the, the clear role that business has to play. Amanda wonderfully showed us what one company can do if it chooses to take the initiative and Rossa has given us some very practical suggestions and solutions. A couple more things to tell you before you jump off. Um, thanking everyone, all of you for coming along today, both attendees and speakers. I think it's been invaluable with what's coming on ahead. Uh, please do fill out the feedback survey so we can improve on this for your future seminars. And the next one is our, our Root Cop 
the route to COP15 series will be held on the 21st of July and will explore science-based targets for nature and how to embed them into your business strategy. I hope you'll join us then, but for now, thank you very much and have a good day.